My name is Larry Cohen. I've been doing social anxiety work in Washington, D.C. since 1990. And along with John Montopoli here from San Francisco, we co-founded the National Social Anxiety Center back in 2014, which I'll describe in a minute. I've been leading social anxiety groups, CBT groups. I'm on my 92nd group. I'm aiming toward 100. I don't know what will happen beyond that, uh, as well as work with many people individually. Holly Scott, who represents our Dallas Regional Clinic in the National Social Anxiety Center, she will be helping me with role plays at various points during this workshop. Neither of us have any uh, commercial relationships to disclose, although we both do represent the National Social Anxiety Center. It is a nonprofit. We don't make money from it. It is a network of currently 16 regional clinics around the country that provide services for people with social anxiety, educational services, as well as services for clinicians, such as this conference, as well as online peer counseling and research summaries and interviews with researchers for other clinicians to learn how to more effectively help people with social anxiety. And if you want more information about NSAC, it's there. I want to say a little bit about the PowerPoint slides. I purposely put too much information on them for you to read here. I think of it as this workshop as having three levels, sort of like if you go to a museum, there's the big print, smaller print, and then you can look up in a booklet for even more information. The big print is Holly and I. That's what I'd like you to pay attention to mainly glance at the slides, but if you try to read th these slides while we're talking, you're going to get distracted. So right now we're more important, but the slides are detailed so that you can read them later on your own if you'd like, which would be a good way to reinforce your learning. And then the third level, if you really want to get into the weeds, there's an additional p uh, PDF handouts that are uploaded. The PowerPoints are uploaded as well. It should appear on your app and in the computer. And the PDF includes a great many worksheets and instructional sheets that I give out to clients, as well as some instructional sheets for myself, for therapists. This slide describes a variety of resources that you can look at on your own that are geared toward therapists who want to learn more about social anxiety, CBT work. Some of these are important training manuals. There's also some really good training videos. And this slide is a bunch of resources for socially anxious consumers. Various websites and other resources that you may find helpful for some of your clients. You could look at these on your own later. I want to stress from the outset that this is an integrative CBT seminar. I aim to bring what are often referred to as the three waves of CBT together. Because although sometimes some practitioners present one wave as replacing the other, I don't see it that way. And I'm pleased to say that increasingly, Practitioners don't see it that way. There's value in all of them, the first wave being the behavior focus approach, such as exposure therapy. The second wave being the cognitive focused approach, although that has always been combined with behavior focus. And then the so-called third wave being a mindfulness focus approach, where people deal with thoughts differently than in the cognitive um, approach. But in my view, they all work. They all have their strengths and limitations. So in this workshop, we'll be bringing them together. I do need to say, though, that for some people, this may be uncomfortable. Because you may have been trained in certain therapies from a purist point of view. 
and be uncomfortable, if you've been trained that it's much more important to deal with your thoughts by accepting them and your anxiety and defusing from them, you'll probably be uncomfortable when we do some role plays in which we're actually arguing with them. Don't worry, we'll also be doing thought diffusion and mindfulness, and I'll discuss how I think they go together and don't contradict each other. Social anxiety disorder, which used to be and somewhat still is called social phobia, is more than a phobia. It's more than anxiety. There are two key elements in social anxiety disorder. Obviously anxiety, but also shame. The core fear of social anxiety pr producing the anxiety is the fear of judgment. And it comes in different ways. It might be the fear of being embarrassed, the fear of being criticized, the fear of being rejected. The fear of judgment is what creates the anxiety element of social anxiety, of course. And there's also a sense of personal deficiency that I'm not good enough. I'm fundamentally deficient compared to other people, not acceptable compared to other people. Or maybe it's conditional. I'm only acceptable if I handle things perfectly. So as a core belief of personal deficiency as well as perfectionistic standards is a core element of social anxiety. Now, although I'm usually referring to social anxiety, technically I'm really referring to social anxiety disorder. And I just want to distinguish that a moment, an experience of social anxiety is perfectly natural. I worry about people, I hardly ever see them in my practice, but I would worry about people who experience no concern about what others think of them. Arguably, that's part of psychopathology. So it's important, in fact, arguably, there's an evolutionary theory that it's important for society to function to have some concern, some anxiety about what do other people think of us. Presumably, society could not function if everybody was entirely narcissistic and really didn't care about others. Actually, even narcissistic people do, but for different reasons. But nonetheless, I don't think society could function if we didn't have a little bit of social anxiety. Social anxiety disorder is when the social anxiety is so severe or pervasive that it's in some way inhibiting, some way debilitating, makes it hard for somebody to pursue one or more life goals. It used to be uh, up till DSM-4, identified that there was a simple form of social anxiety and a generalized form of social anxiety. They dropped, this, they dropped those distinction because for the large majority of people with social anxiety, it is generalized. There are some people who are only anxious about public speaking or only anxious about writing or eating in front of others, but actually not many. The majority of people with social anxiety disorder are socially anxious in quite a variety of situations. There's a conceptualization that I'll be using in this workshop that is somewhat useful. It's not perfectly accurate, I want to acknowledge, but it's a useful tool that on the anxiety front anyways, this doesn't really address shame, we'll get into that later, but on the anxiety front, you can think of the intensity of anxiety in a formula fashion. That anxiety intensity is determined by how likely we think a threat is times how severe we think the threat would be if it occurred, how badly it would affect us, plus some physiological elements such as, did you have too much coffee? Are you taking a drug that has anxiety as a side effects? Were you born with a genetic predisposition predis toward anxiety? All of that, though, is divided by our belief in our ability to cope. So if we 
have much self-confidence in our belief and our ability to cope, our anxiety intensity should not be very high. So part of anxiety therapy in CBT is not just reducing anxiety, it's also increasing self-confidence, our belief in our ability to handle things. There are many debates, some of these quite heated, most of them not so heated, but still important debates in the CBT field for social anxiety treatment that I will be mentioning and discussing how I try to bring them together, a synthesis, the best of both. The first of these is do we work on accepting or decreasing our anxiety? And of course, <laughs> acceptance and commitment therapy would be gung-ho about accepting, even embracing your anxiety while focusing on pursuing valued activities. Traditional exposure therapy would be working toward habituation, i.e. greatly reducing anxiety, as does cognitive therapy traditionally. I think both are correct, actually. In the short run, it is to the advantage of most, if not all, clients to set aside the goal of reducing anxiety and increase the sense of being able to cope with anxiety while pursuing their life goals. But absolutely it makes sense to want to reduce the anxiety. That's part of the definition in both the DSM and the uh, other definitions of social anxiety disorder. It's not just about avoidance. Somebody with social anxiety disorder may avoid infrequently, but they still have social anxiety disorder if they endure severe discomfort when they're doing some activities repeatedly. And so part of overcoming social anxiety disorder is reducing the anxiety, but that ought not be the short-term goal because it creates a sense of pressure on clients that paradoxically will increase their anxiety. There are a number of diversity factors that are important to keep in mind in social anxiety work. I'm not going to get into these in great detail, but I do want to stress that people in different groupings, whether it's LGBT folks, women, people of racial and ethnic minorities, people who come from different countries or different cultures, people who are viewed as less physically attractive by society, people who don't have outgoing personalities by their nature, people who have physical disabilities, and certainly people on the autism spectrum the reality is there's a lot of judgment that happens in life. The fear of judgment is not just in our heads, it's also in reality. And it actually is more in reality for some people than others. I started this work in 1990, is that right? Yeah, uh, 1980, 90. I started this a long time ago. <laughs> It's, it's on a slide somewhere. <laughs> Senior moment, it is 1990. And I used to lead social anxiety CBT groups strictly for the, what we called at that time, the gay and lesbian community, the LGBT community. Because I presumed that it was a bigger problem for them, although I didn't have any research on that, but the fear of judgment, most of my clients were baby boomers at that time, and I would be running three or four social anxiety groups concurrently twice a year, 20-week groups. Now I get far fewer LGBT clients, although I still get some, uh, but it's more persons with gender identity issues that tend to be struggling with social anxiety, but sometimes gay, lesbian, and bi folks as well. And certainly people in racial minorities, I've had people with physical disabilities, and being in DC, we have a lot of people from other countries. 
some countries which have an introverted sort of cultural norm and they come to this country that has a very extroverted norm and experience anxiety because of that. So indeed, judgment is not just in our heads. I want to share with you some sad facts. This workshop is primarily clinical, so I'm just going to go over these and research briefly. The most important thing that I want to emphasize is that it's my belief that the clinical community tends to underestimate social anxiety disorder, the importance of it. This seems to be improving over the years, but I do think there's an underestimation of that. Specifically, I don't think many clinicians realize how common it is. In the U.S. anyways, 12% of people have social anxiety disorder at some point in their lives and more than 7% in a given year. And it's somewhat higher among adolescents. One third of all people fear public speaking. In fact, there was a great Seinfeld episode in which he mentioned that public speaking anxiety is the highest anxiety even above the fear of death. I'm not sure if that's true, but Seinfeld <laughs> said it. And so he concluded that most people would rather be in the casket rather than giving a eulogy. <laughs> Social anxiety, depending on the survey, is the third or fourth most common mental health disorder in the US, and it's, depending on the survey, the first or second most common anxiety disorder, and anxiety disorders are the most common class of disorders in the US. I keep stressing in the US because in some other countries this is quite different. Also, it's a severe problem. Two-thirds of people with social anxiety, approximately, have at least one other mental health disorder. Most commonly, other anxiety disorders, depression, sometimes social anxiety so severe that it fits within the rubric of avoidant personality disorder. And roughly, 70% of people with social anxiety have at least moderate, if not severe, levels of impairment. So it's not just someone being a little shy. It's very pervasive and can be very severe. It also greatly inhibits somebody's life. And these are rather sad facts. People with social anxiety disorder as a group, this isn't true of every individual, tend to get lower grades in school, tend to get promoted less in adulthood on the job, tend to earn less money as a result, are less likely to be married or partnered, are less likely to have children, and are likely to have fewer friends. The good news is that CBT for social anxiety is actually quite effective, depending on the surveys. About two-thirds to three-fourths of people receiving CBT for social anxiety, even without medications, recover. And their benefits last. Some people make further progress on their own. And in my experience, even when they relapse a bit, they quickly recover with a little bit of help. So there's good news as well. There's an interesting thing to think about, which is, according to exposure therapy, so-called wave one approaches, if we expose ourselves to the anxiety trigger, in this case, interacting with people in whichever setting somebody is anxious about, enough that sooner or later our anxiety will habituate. And although most socially, anx socially anxious persons are somewhat avoidant, 
It's a rare socially anxious person. In fact, I don't think I've met one, although they probably wouldn't come to me if, if that were the case. But it's a rare socially anxious person that avoids every trigger. Even people that are clearly have avoided personality disorder don't avoid everything. So the question is, if somebody has probably daily exposure to their anxiety triggers, why, is there, why are they still socially anxious? Why is their anxiety not habituating? I mean, sure, if you're afraid of flying and you always avoid flying, sure, it makes sense your anxiety wouldn't habituate. But that's not true with social anxiety. It's a rare person that it manages to avoid all interactions. By the way, there are a handful of seats left for those of you standing in the back. If you look around, don't worry about judgment, just grab a seat. <laughs> And there's a number of things to keep in mind in this regard that help explain this phenomenon. <coughs> One is that the thing that people are anxious about, that they fear when they're socially anxious, is usually invisible judgment. Sometimes people voice negative judgment, and certainly if you're an adolescent or child, that's pretty frequent. But in adulthood, not so frequent. It does happen, but less frequently. And so a lot of times people are afraid of this invisible thing that they can't know whether or not it happened. Even if somebody reacts well to them on the outside, a socially anxious person will often go away and think, well, I was lucky this time, or that person was just being nice. Who knows what he or she is really thinking. In addition, there's a negativity bias among people with social anxiety. They tend to pay attention to what seems to be negative much more than the positive. There's interesting research that shows people without social anxiety disorder have a positive, positivity bias. They pay attention more to the positive feedback than the negative. It seems terribly unfair, but nonetheless, Socially anxious people pay more attention to the negative. They're, they're less likely to see the positive. If they do see the positive, they're more likely to disqualify. It is somehow not counting. I was lucky. They were just being nice. And they often ruminate about what they perceived as negative afterwards, so that the negative starts feeling much bigger than it was. And like probably all anxiety disorders, socially anxious people rely heavily on a variety of safety behaviors. I prefer to call them safety-seeking behaviors just because it rarely actually brings them safety. But in social anxiety, those safety behaviors are often not so obvious. Avoidance is quite obvious, but the internal behaviors of self-monitoring, self-critiquing, attempting to mind-read how other people are thinking of them, those are safety-seeking behaviors as well, and it's not obvious to clinicians that aren't trained in that. And so that's another reason why social anxiety disorder tends not to habituate naturally. Finally, as I said, a big element of social anxiety disorder for most people is shame. Shame does not habituate. Anxiety often does. Shame does not. You need to challenge shame in other ways. And we'll talk about that when we do core belief work in particular. There are many triggers for social anxiety. And although it's called social anxiety, it's not just anxiety, as I'm sure you realize, in social settings. It could be anxiety at work, at staff meetings, in public bathrooms, so-called shy bladder or pea shyness, which can be severely debilitating for some people. The clinical term is periuresis, is a type of social anxiety. Stage fright for performers, for public speakers, for uh, whatever else. Um, stage fright is also a form of social anxiety. Being observed or thinking that you're being observed, simply going to some sort of place where there are strangers around, or maybe not even strangers, people that you know, and having the feeling that people are observing you and watching you. I have somebody in my group now 
who actually is rather extroverted, and on the outside you would think, why is he in this group? He doesn't seem at all socially anxious. He's very communicative. He's kind of the life of the group. But outside of the group setting, he has this belief that whenever he's around people, people are observing him and judging how he appears, even though in one-on-one -on -one conversation he's okay. And finally, and very importantly, most people with social anxiety are afraid of their anxiety showing and being judged. It's a double whammy that produces a vicious cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy. It might be that they have physical symptoms like blushing or sweating or being jittery in their voice or hands. Or it might be that they're afraid that their anxiety will mess up their so-called performance, how well they speak or converse with people. And so they're anxious about their anxiety showing, which makes them more self-conscious and anxious. Sexual so-called performance anxiety, although it's classed in the DSM separately, in my belief is a form of social anxiety disorder as well because it's based on the fear of being judged, embarrassed, rejected. So there are many types of triggers. When working in social anxiety, it's important to keep in mind different elements. There's a before, during, and after element of social anxiety. We're not just working with the situations, the triggers in which somebody is experiencing anxiety, but there's a tendency to worry a great deal beforehand, to ruminate, to beat themselves up a great deal afterwards, and it's important to work in all of those elements. And also the different levels of cognition are important to address. Both the automatic thoughts, I call them hot thoughts, the underlying assumptions and personal rules and core beliefs, the tendency to be negatively focused, as I said earlier, the tendency to worry and ruminate before and after, as well as to work with both the behaviors, emotions, and also the physiology of social anxiety. There's various elements to keep in mind. Another debate is what's the difference between various things? So I want to mention again, social anxiety disorder is when the fear of judgment is so pervasive or debilitating that it prevents somebody from pursuing at least one major life goal. Although typically it's multiple goals, like making friends, pursuing career, pursuing romantic relationships, going shopping, etc. Whereas social anxiety, when used precisely, is just the experience of the fear of judgment, which doesn't necessarily mean the person has social anxiety disorder. This is often confused with introversion. I haven't seen research on this. It wouldn't surprise me from my own work if introverts, at least in the US, are more likely to have social anxiety disorder than extroverts, although I have not seen research on this. But extroverts can have socially, social anxiety disorder as well. And typically in my groups, about a third of them are extroverted, although it's usually not clear until later in the group as they start recovering which ones go to large parties and which ones go to much smaller activities. Introversion, extroversion, that personality continuum is perfectly natural. Social anxiety is when we fear judgment, whether it's in an introverted or extroverted setting. There's some debate as to whether shyness is distinct from social anxiety or whether it's simply less severe social anxiety. My perspective on this is shyness is just a word. It's not a clinical definition. It's not in the DSM. There's no there's no diagnosis or even, uh, even set of symptoms that are called shy in the DSM. It's just a word. And so if you look for the source of meaning of words, dictionaries, both the Oxford English Dictionary as well as the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, 
shyness clearly is a type of social anxiety. It's not necessarily social anxiety disorder, but it is being nervous or timid in the company of others. That's social anxiety. So when people say shyness isn't social anxiety, I think what they're saying is you can have experiences of shyness without having social anxiety disorder, which I agree. And finally, avoidant personality disorder is, in my opinion, but not only my opinion, it's actually in the footnotes of the DSM, probably a severe form of social anxiety. In fact, in my reading of the definitions of avoidant personality disorder, I believe it is literally impossible, not unlikely, impossible to have avoidant personality disorder and not also suffer from social anxiety disorder, although it is certainly possible to have social anxiety disorder and not suffer from avoidant personality disorder. There are various debates that are illuminated by research on social anxiety. Most importantly, and in the handouts, there's information about this in detail if you're interested. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the most effective therapy for social anxiety disorder. CBTR is cognitive behavioral therapy with a relationship focused. CBT is more effective than exposure therapy alone, although exposure therapy is a part of cognitive behavioral therapy, but if you do exposure therapy alone, it's moderately effective, but not as effective as CBT. It's CBT is definitely more effective than social skills training. CBT is more effective than medications, and there are a variety of medications for social anxiety disorder. It's more effective than self-help group for social anxiety disorder. It's more effective than mindfulness meditation. In fact, mindfulness meditation is less effective than placebo for social anxiety disorder. Mindfulness practiced in a different way is absolutely crucial, and I'll get into that in a, in a minute. CBT is also more effective than other psychotherapies for social anxiety disorder. And although I've led a great many, and still am, social anxiety groups, in general, individual CBT tends to be a bit more effective than group CBT, although both are more effective than anything else. And I think that really depends on the person, because I've had people that I've worked with individually who've made moderate progress, but when they joined a group, specifically for social anxiety, they made much more progress, because there's all sorts of activities you could do in groups that are much more limited individually. But regardless, I think the main reason individual tends to be more effective is they get more individualized attention, but I don't have research that specifically says that. There's some research that indicates that there may be genetic links to social anxiety, and they've even identified um, a serotonin transport gene, and there's some research that suggests that people with social anxiety, um, to the contrary, actually have higher levels of serotonin in their system than people without, even though SSRIs often help them. In fact, interestingly, there's research that's uh, with social anxiety from about a year ago that gave Lexapro to two groups of people with social anxiety disorder. One group, they honestly said, you're on Lexapro. And the other group, they lied to and, were, and said that you're on an active placebo. Active meaning that's why you have some side effects, perhaps, but it's a placebo, it's not a drug. And, the, and they, they weren't given CBT, this was strictly a medication study, and the people who were honestly told that they were on Lexapro made 300% more progress on the same medication, the same dosage, than the people who believed that they were on a placebo. So clearly expectancy, what people believe is a big part of recovery. 
And as I mentioned earlier, there's also research indicating negativity bias and perfectionism in social anxiety. There are five core strategies for social anxiety, and I'm going to have them up on this sheet of paper as well so that you could see them. External mindfulness, cognitive restructuring, assertion training, and core belief work, all of which come together in doing experiments, sometimes called exposures. I will be discussing all of these. I will be discussing them in the order that I usually work with them with clients, but it depends on the client. I stress that mindfulness work with people who are socially anxious needs to be based on externally focused mindfulness, not meditation. Meditation is internally focused. And as I said earlier, people who are given just meditation training and mindfulness make less progress than people who are given a placebo. They make some progress, but not as much. Whereas externally focused mindfulness, sometimes it's just called attention training, is a core part of CBT for social anxiety. And why it's so important is most people, when they are socially anxious, unless trained otherwise, tend to be internally focused already. And although the type of training you have in mindfulness meditation is a different type of internal focus, you're diffusing from thoughts, not engaging with them, still socially anxious people need to be trained to focus externally on the conversation, the persons they're interacting with, the activity. I say this over and over again with my clients. Focus not on your thoughts and feelings, but on the people, the conversations, the activities. Mindfulness, as I'm sure you know, does not mean meditation. It means paying attention to something in the present moment. It's not necessarily your breath or a mantra. It could be a conversation. And paying attention with curiosity rather than judgment, just seeking to take it in rather than evaluating how am I doing in this person's eyes. The other side of the coin of mindfulness, part and parcel of mindfulness, is usually called thought diffusion, but it's really thought and feeling diffusion. It's being aware of your thoughts and feelings without engaging them, without becoming involved with them. And of course, there is a debate, should mindfulness be taught as external focus or as meditation? Although I do mindfulness meditation with clients for other reasons, I rarely do it with people for their social anxiety. But do remember, two thirds of people with social anxiety have other problems for which mindfulness meditation might be useful. But early on in treatment, if they're coming to me to help overcome their social anxiety disorder, I don't teach meditation. I teach externally focused mindfulness. Later on, I may incorporate, incorporate meditative techniques if I think it would be useful for them. I introduce mindfulness to clients, external mindfulness in a variety of ways. Sometimes I ask somebody to imagine that two different people on their right and left we're having two different conversations with them at the same time. Not part of the same conversation, but two different conversations. And ask them, how do they imagine that would be? And most of them would say, it would be very distracting. I wouldn't be able to follow one or the other. Our brains, as remarkable as they are, have a very, very, very limited ability to pay attention to more than one thing at a time within a realm. In this case, primarily the verbal realm. And so through that analogy, clients understand at the very least, internal focus on that conversation going on in your head, all those negative thoughts, distracts you 
from the actual conversation going on in front of your face. I also give an analogy of an actor on stage. Imagine an actor who's very concerned about the audience judging her or the professional critics in the audience who are going to write up judgments and publish it in newspapers. It's natural that she would feel anxious about those concerns, but imagine that the way that actor copes is by focusing internally and evaluating her performance. Oh, I didn't do that very well. I should have said this line like that. I didn't move correctly. And then I ask a client, how do you imagine that would affect the actor? And almost any client could say, it would mess up their performance. And then we discuss how that's what you're doing, whether you're on stage or just chatting with someone at a meetup. You're evaluating your performance, quote unquote, performance conversation, usually while you're performing. And that messes up your performance. That's the core element of sexual performance <laughs> anxiety or shy bladder syndrome as well. It's not only conversational anxiety. I also use the analogy of being with a friend at an outdoor cafe when the weather is better and talking with your friend, but there's all sorts of noises around you, other patrons, other uh, clinking of dishes, other sounds, cars going by. And most clients are able to see upon questioning that they're pretty good at focusing on their friend and they will sometimes get distracted by these other sounds, but what we turn, do is then return our attention back to our friend. And I explained that's what we're talking about with external mindfulness and thought diffusion. We mainly want to focus on the actual interaction and when we get distracted, by our internal thoughts and feelings, and we will be. We just notice the distraction and return our attention back. There's various ways that I train clients in external mindfulness. The first way, Holly and I will demonstrate in a role play, this happens sometimes in the very first, certainly by the second session beyond assessment that is. So if you could come on forward, Holly. So I'll be the therapist and Holly will be the client. So Holly, I'm thinking it would be useful for us to have a practice social conversation, pretending that I'm somebody that you met in some sort of social environment rather than being your therapist in this office. Okay, I'll try. Okay, and tell me, when you're in a social conversation with a new person, someone you don't already know well, what goes on in your mind? So my biggest concern is they're going to know that I'm nervous because they're going to see that I blush, they're going to see my hands shake, they're going to hear it in my voice. And when that happens, then all they're going to be thinking about is, well, what's wrong with her? she's kind of weird or kind of deficient in some way. Okay, so that's helpful to know. And when you have those concerns, I call them hot thoughts going on in your mind, what do you do? So I, I have several things that, that I do to, so no one will know my hands are shaking. I sit on my hands a lot or I hold them behind my back. And because my voice shakes, I try to make sure that I just, if I don't talk a lot, they won't notice it. And okay. so that's what I try to do. Okay, all that makes sense. So I'm gonna suggest that we have a conversation for a couple minutes. Again, pretend I'm somebody you're meeting at, say a meetup, okay? A okay. social activity. And what I'd like you to do is to focus your attention on your handshaking, on possibly blushing, on how you imagine I might be thinking about you and judging you, just like you would be if you were actually meeting a stranger in a social setting, okay? Okay. So focus your attention on those things. Hi, I'm Larry. Good to meet you. Hi. What's your name? Holly. Hi, Holly. Have you gone to this meetup before? Yeah. Okay, and wh what do you like about it? Why do you keep coming? Um, um, 
I, I don't know. Okay. And imagine this goes on for a few minutes. In the therapy, <laughs> in the therapy office, we would be doing this for about five minutes. Well, thank you, Holly. So tell me, how are you feeling? So just thinking about having to do that, is, it just gives me all this anxiety. And I feel really tense. And then I start to feel sad, too, because I just can't do it. OK. And how do you think the conversation went? <coughs> Not well. In what way? So all I could think about is, what am I going to say next? And how can I say it in as few words as possible? Did thinking about what to say next help you come up with things to say? No, because obviously I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> OK. OK. Very good. Now I'm going to suggest that we redo the conversation. Actually, we continue the conversation. But this time, try to treat all the stuff going on inside of your head, inside of your body, as noise. Something you're aware of but you're not paying attention to. And instead, get lost in the conversation. Get engrossed in the conversation. Focus with curiosity, with interest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So give that a try. Everything inside of you is noise. What's going on here is what you're engrossed with. Okay. This is the first time I've been at this meetup. I'm going to meet up to make friends, and I've been to some that are okay, but this one seems the most interesting one for me. There's more people, they're more diverse. So tell me about other meetups you've gone to. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. There seems to be a lot more people here and different types of, like you said. Um, so it is, it is different from other ones. And what do you like about it? Um, well, I come to meetups because I'm trying to really work on developing more friendships. Um, and so it's nice for me to have different types of people to talk to. Okay, very good. And again, in a therapy session, we would do this for about five minutes. So Holly, how do you feel this conversation went? So it's a little better. I mean, I, I tried not to hold my hand so, so tightly, and I allowed myself to actually speak in full sentences um, because I was not worrying, trying not to worry anyway about my voice. Um, and how did you feel? So I definitely was still anxious yeah. because it's so hard for me. But, but I th I'd say that you know, my anxiety probably went down like 10 or 15, maybe, maybe 10%. OK, that's really good. So what could you think you can learn from this experiment? So remember that when I go in situations, to, when I'm speaking with new people, to try to not focus on mind reading, like what are they thinking about me, and, and just try to really focus on the, get lost in the conversation as opposed to the worry. Okay, so that's an important element in learning how to overcome your social anxiety problems. I call it getting out of your head and into the moment, or the other expression is getting lost in the conversation. So I'm going to suggest you practice that as homework every day during any conversations you have. Whether you're anxious or comfortable, doesn't matter. Try to get lost in the conversation and ignore what's ever going on in your head and your body during the conversation. OK. Sounds good. Usually in this exercise, as happened here, you only see a moderate improvement. But the important part of the exercise is not that this alone solves things for them, but it demonstrates the importance of external mindfulness. And that's one of the key ways I introduce it. There's a couple other things that I do that have some use, although this exercise is the most useful. What do I say next? I'm coming across as so uninteresting, so boring as usual. I gotta get out of this conversation. These are examples of social anxiety hot thoughts. What's he thinking of? One dreary day I sat down and recorded about ten minutes of this. I had to do it a few times because initially it was on a tape. And one of the things I do in session is something like I'm doing now. I play the recording, but have a conversation with the client 
and ask the client to treat all that stuff as noise and to focus on our conversation. And then after that, and I'm asking you to do that as well, ignore that and listen to me. And after that, I ask the client, how did that go? How did it feel? And it depends on the client. Some clients say that they weren't able to do that, but still that's an educational experience because it helps them recognize the importance of practicing diffusing from their thoughts because they weren't able to do it even in this artificial kind of exercise. Other clients are able to say, yeah, occasionally I got distracted, but I was able to return my attention. That's also an educational piece as well. And of course, this isn't exactly how it is for socially anxious people, but it is similar. They usually have fewer hot thoughts, but they are repetitive, they are on their mind, and they are distracting. And typically, socially anxious people are focused on those, as well as focused on monitoring their symptoms. There's also something that Adrian Wells in Britain has developed, which he calls the attention training technique. And there's two recordings. This is a cacophony of sounds, several different sounds. We practice briefly in session, then I ask clients to practice as homework. What they're practicing doing <coughs> is paying attention to one sound at a time and diffusing from the others. Usually they start with whichever sound is easiest to focus on, the church bells or the clock ticking. There are other more subtle sounds like birds or insects. And the whole point is to just get better control over what you choose to pay attention to and what you choose to treat as background noise. The second recording over there, I won't actually play now, but it's the same cacophony, only there's this nice British guy who's giving you instructions. Pay attention to this sound, then pay attention to that sound, etc. And that's something for them to practice with. I ask clients to practice daily and tell them that when you start getting bored with this, which for some clients happens relatively early, for some not so, I ask them to go into public settings where you can just sit and do some people watching, like a food court or a park bench in an, on a nice day, and practice paying attention to one thing that they hear or see at a time and treat other things like background noise and then switch what they're paying attention to. But the most important way of practicing, if someone can close that door, that'd be great. Noise. <laughs> Background noise, I need to practice. The most important way to practice external focus, external mindfulness, for socially anxious people is what I call curiosity training. And I have a variety of handouts that describe everything that I'm working on today, including this. You will see that in your PDFs that are in the ADA app. But basically, I ask clients to, every day, for at least five minutes, practice paying attention with interest, with curiosity, to a conversation they're in, starting with conversations that they're not so anxious about. And as the weeks go on, progressing to conversations that they're more and more anxious about. And whenever they're distracted by their negative thoughts, to treat them like background noise and to return their attention to the conversation and taking interest in the person. There are some other thought diffusion techniques that I take from acceptance and commitment therapy that I introduce a little bit later as well. But the most important element is curiosity training. And there is a log that I use for clients to help them record their practice in doing the curiosity training or the attention training using the recordings or sitting in public places. And the reason for the log is partly just to 
encourage people to be doing this daily, but also to hopefully see that their mindfulness ratings are going up. The second major approach for CBT for social anxiety is doing cognitive restructuring. I probably ought to be calling it cognitive reframing because the term cognitive restructuring is very clinical sounding and I keep meaning to change that in my various handouts. But then I realize it's in so many of my handouts that I just don't. <laughs> but nonetheless, cognitive restructuring is not simply the thought record. The thought record is just one means of doing cognitive restructuring. There are many means. Cognitive restructuring, as you all know, is learning to identify your hot thoughts, the thoughts that are disturbing to you, in this case creating social anxiety or shame, or both. Learning to challenge those against real world evidence, and learning to come up with an alternative thought. Sometimes it's called a rational response. I prefer to call it a constructive attitude because I don't want to imply that their own hot thoughts are irrational. They're not really irrational, they're exaggerated. And cognitive restructuring helps change our perception of the likelihood of the threat and the severity of the threat. And so potentially will decrease our anxiety because of that. These are common examples of social anxiety hot thoughts. I have them in three different categories, although in reality these categories are somewhat overlapping. A lot of social anxiety is the concern about how we appear. It may be about our physical <coughs> looks, and there's some overlap, just some, with social anxiety and body dysmorphic disorder, although there's not usually obsessional checking with social anxiety disorder. But it's more common that socially anxious people are concerned about how they come across. Maybe because of physical symptoms, like I'm a blusher, and I've been a blusher since a little kid, and it's remarkable how often people feel the desire to point out when I'm blushing. And it used to bother me a great deal, Eventually in life, I learned it was adorable and, <laughs> right? <laughs> but for a long time, it triggered a great deal of social anxiety, embarrassment, shame for me. And it's not like I can stop blushing by choosing to. Socially anxious people are often concerned about what they view as performance, including conversation. I'd rather people not think of conversation as performance, but socially anxious people sure do. But it could also be their sexual so-called performance, again, another unfortunate use of the word performance, or even using public bathrooms, especially for men at urinals, but it could be for women as well. Thinking of that as a performance that's being observed and evaluated by others, which makes them tense and not able to urinate. It could be their performance in a more traditional sense public speaking, stage performance, doing their work, taking a test. I view all that as forms of social anxiety, and these are some of the hot thoughts people have. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the fear of judgment. The fear that people will be thinking badly of us, maybe because we appear anxious, or maybe because our performance isn't perfect in some way. One of the big debates in so-called third versus second wave cognitive behavioral therapies, not only about social anxiety but about everything else, is do we work on changing the relationship we have with our, again, what I call hot thoughts, disturbing cognitions, <coughs> or do we work on changing the content? Cognitive restructuring, stemming from so-called second wave CBTs, works on changing the content. 
so that it is more realistic and helpful. Whereas mindfulness strategies, thought diffusion in particular, works on changing the way you relate to your hot thoughts. Seeing them as passing events in your mind where you want to accept them and then disconnect, defuse from them while you focus on a valued activity. In our case, the valued activity usually being the conversation or the activity or the person. In my belief, they're both important. Clearly for some clients, one is more important than the other. But for most of my clients, at the end of therapy, when I give them a survey of all the different techniques that we've used in cognitive restructuring, mindfulness and thought diffusion are among a list of other things that we do, those two always rate really high and more or less neck to neck. Again, some clients like one more than the other, but they're both rated as really helpful. The way I put these together, the synthesis, is that I teach cognitive restructuring as something to do before and or after a social anxiety trigger, and external mindfulness with thought diffusion is something to do during a social anxiety trigger, when you're at the meetup or speaking at a staff meeting or for that matter standing at a urinal or having sex. There's a little bit of overlap in that there are brief ways of doing cognitive restructuring during a trigger. Usually it's having a memorized, short, constructive attitude, self-statement to say to themselves occasionally, but we don't want that to become a distraction. So mainly I teach cognitive restructuring for before and after and external mindfulness for during. There's also debate about the timing of doing cognitive restructuring. You wouldn't think that something as straightforward as cognitive restructuring would be so controversial, but there's all sorts of debates. So even within the CBT for social anxiety world, that small world, there's considerable debates between different clinicians and trainers as to whether it's better to do cognitive restructuring before triggers, which is how Richard Heinberg, who developed the first, as far as I know, treatment manual for social anxiety disorder, uh, trains clients in doing cognitive restructuring worksheets before. Or like Stefan Hoffman and David M. Clark in England, I stress that because there are multiple David Clarks in the CBT world. Today we're talking about the English one where they stress doing cognitive restructuring after experiments by analyzing the results of an experiment because they feel that people's learning is deeper, is more effective if it's based on experience with emotion attached to it. In other words, learning while you're anxious, learning through surprise. Hey, gee, this went better than I thought it would. In my view, they're both <coughs> useful. And so initially, I teach cognitive restructuring early on, mainly because it increases the likelihood that the clients are going to do the experiments, so-called exposures. There's no learning that happens if they <laughs> avoid the exposure, at least no useful learning. And so cognitive restructuring beforehand with newer clients helps them lessen their anxiety and makes it more likely for them to follow through. Then as somebody starts making progress, often just a month into it, I teach them to set aside the cognitive restructuring before whenever they're willing. Sometimes they're not willing, but whenever they're willing and to go into the experiment exposure by focusing mindfully, externally, thought diffusion, as well as working on some behavioral goals, which might be introducing themselves to a few strangers, having conversations that last more than five minutes if the stranger finds it useful. 
I leave it up to clients. So I introduce both the before and after approach. Another debate is do we target verbal thoughts or images? And of course, you've learned enough already about me, my answer is both. Some practitioners say that images, especially for social anxiety, maybe anxiety disorders in general, tend to be more emotion laden than verbal thoughts. And therefore, it's more important to teach people to change their imagery, which is a form of cognitive restructuring, but done through imagery rather than worksheets where you are writing words down. Again, it's my experience that it depends on the client. I don't know about you, I close my eyes, I see nothing. <laughs> and it always annoys me, a little personal grief. Unless I'm asleep, then I might see something. Maybe it just says something about my limited imagination, but people that teach imagery techniques for whatever the issue, never seem to acknowledge that there are a fair number of people like me that actually have limited capacity to do imagery. And I'm very verbal, as you've noticed already. And it varies person to person, so I usually teach both and see whatever works best for them. I introduce cognitive restructuring to clients initially by using examples, so if, based on the client's main fear. So if the client's main fear is interacting with strangers, or at least one of their main fears in a social setting, I ask them to imagine going into that meetup or that party where you don't know anybody other than maybe the host, or if it's a meetup, you might not know anyone at all. And imagine that what's on your mind is no one will like me, I'm going to be really awkward in conversation, the people over there who glanced at me and are now laughing are probably snickering at me because I appear odd and awkward. And then I ask them, how do you think that would affect the way you feel? Obviously it makes them anxious, maybe ashamed. How do you think that would affect your behavior? I might leave then or I might become the wallflower and stay off by the side, avoid eye contact so people don't come up to talk to me. What if somebody comes up to talk to you anyways? How would that affect your behavior? They might say, I keep the attention off myself by doing the, um, what I call, uh, it's like pulling teeth, safety behavior. In other words, saying very little at a time. And then I asked them to imagine that you went into the same party or meetup, but instead of having the hot thought that you're going to do a bad job and people won't like you and the people over there are snickering at you and, and talking about you negatively, imagine that you walk in and you think, boy, this looks interesting. I bet I could have a good time. Maybe I'll even meet someone that ultimately I could become friends with. Maybe I can get a date. Imagine that you came in with thoughts like that instead, how would that affect the way you feel? How would that affect your behavior? And most clients are able to see that there's a dramatic difference both in their feelings and their behavior, but also the way people relate to them. If they're avoiding eye contact, if they're speaking very briefly, if at all, that most people will ultimately leave the conversation very quickly. But if you're making eye contact and you're speaking more about yourself and you're focusing externally, that there's a greater likelihood of longer, more flowing conversations. The limitation of mindfulness and diffusion <laughs> techniques is that if a client believes very strongly in their hot thoughts, the likelihood of them acting the opposite the likelihood of them even being able to treat those hot thoughts as background noise is much lower than if they realize, well, okay, these hot thoughts are bothering me a lot, but I also see that they're not realistic. Which is why I find that cognitive restructuring and mindfulness plus thought diffusion go well together, because cognitive restructuring is aimed at decreasing the belief in the hot thoughts 
whereas mindfulness and thought diffusion is aimed in part of setting aside those hot thoughts, treating them like noise. However, there are some clients who know right away that, yeah, this is just old noise, old tapes as we used to call it in my head. And for them, I, the focus may be primarily thought diffusion techniques. But frankly, most socially anxious clients I've worked with really believe their hot thoughts. They really believe that this person may be judging me and it would really be awful if they did. At least in DC where I work, a lot of clients initially call cognitive restructuring spin. It just wrinkles me. I really want to stress the idea is we're not, dis spin is distorting truth in order to get your point across. Cognitive restructuring is modifying our thoughts so that they are truer. So it also is not the, po the power of positive thinking, although typically constructive attitudes are more positive than our hot thoughts, of course. But as I said earlier, judgment happens. Social anxiety is not an irrational fear, it's an exaggerated fear. We do get judged. And so coming up with a constructive <coughs> attitude is not the Stuart Smalley thing of everyone likes me, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people love me. That's not realistic, that's spin, that's the power of positive thinking. A more common constructive attitude for socially anxious people is if I interact with mindfulness and let go of some of my safety, other safety seeking behaviors, that chances are the conversation will go better and that more people will connect well with me and I'll connect well with more people. And if somebody doesn't, that's unfortunate, but no one's liked by everyone, et cetera. So it's not necessarily the power of positive thinking. It's more realistic thinking. In fact, I teach that there are three criteria for a good constructive attitude. One, that it be truer, more realistic. One is that it be more helpful, make it easier for you to work on your values, such as meeting new people, developing friendships or romantic relationships or advancing their career, whatever their values, their priorities are. And also that it be more compassionate with themselves. Socially anxious people tend to be very harsh on themselves. There's various ways of doing cognitive restructuring. One is using worksheets, and I'll show you mine in a minute that's, actually let me do th that now. This is an example of a cognitive restructuring worksheet. The main difference from a traditional thought record is that there's an emphasis on behaviors as well. So you're identifying safety seeking behaviors, which we'll discuss later, and coming up with behavioral goals as well acting the opposite, more or less, from your safety-seeking behaviors. But otherwise, this worksheet is similar to a traditional thought record. Cognitive restructuring can be used using post-experiment worksheets, which I'll show you later when we discuss experiments. But in other words, doing cognitive restructuring after having done an experiment or an exposure to see what's the evidence that I gathered from that, what can I learn from that, what does it tell me about my hot thoughts and perhaps my underlying core beliefs and assumptions. There are apps for cognitive restructuring. I haven't found one that I like entirely because they rarely include the behaviors, but one that I usually encourage people to use if they want an app is mentioned there, the CBT Thought Diary, although the name is unfortunate, it's not a diary, it's really a worksheet. Cognitive restructuring can be done through the use of videos, we'll discuss that later, and there's a worksheet that goes with that as well. One of the most interesting and powerful ways that cognitive restructuring can be done is through role plays. Usually I teach it in a worksheet first, and Holly and I would like to demonstrate that. So Holly, we've been discussing the cognitive restructuring worksheet you did, and you told me that you found it pretty helpful, but that you're still pretty anxious, right? Yes, yeah. And you were saying earlier that you kind of believe the constructive attitude, certainly in your head, 
but in your heart or your gut, you're not entirely there, right? Right, yeah, Larry, it's kind of like, I believe it when I, when I make myself really think about it, but I still get nervous. And that's perfectly normal because you've been, in essence, practicing the hot thoughts for many years, and you've really been practicing the constructive attitude just for about a week or two now. There's an exercise that we can do, a type of experiment that I think at the very least will be fun. And I'm thinking that it might help deepen your belief in the constructive attitude and more importantly, weaken your belief in your hot thoughts so that you could treat them like background noise rather than take them seriously. And here's what I suggest. I'm gonna, in this exercise, pretend that I am your hot thoughts. So for this purpose, I am not a person, I'm certainly not your therapist for the next few minutes. I am your hot thoughts. You are Holly, and your job is to shut me up. And to shut me up using a combination of reason and emotion. By reason, I mean tell me why you think I'm wrong and address me okay. as you, okay? okay? And emotion is try to get into this with oomph. Not dryly like a Harvard debate, but really try to put some real oomph into it, okay? Okay, and I can kind of get mad at you? Oh, please. Anything that you find helpful, or you can laugh at me, or, just, you know, don't hit me, but anything else, <laughs> anything else that you find to help you shut me up would be <laughs> beneficial. Okay. Okay. So the subject is the same thing we were working on in the worksheet, is going to a meetup and talking with new people with the long-term goal of making friends, but the immediate goal of just talking to new people, getting to know some people a bit. Okay. So remember, I'm your hot thoughts, I'm not Larry. You better not go there, you're gonna make a fool out of yourself. You're not right. I, you, I, you don't have any evidence that that is true. What do you mean? You've made a fool out of yourself almost every time you've done something like this. You are not correct when you say that. That I'm, I'm not going to believe that. You just, you are wrong. But it always goes badly. People always reject you and laugh at you. They notice your symptoms of anxiety and think badly of you. You know what? I'm so tired of hearing that. It's been, it's been hurting me so long, my whole life, and I just can't listen to that anymore. It's just not true. Hurting you? I'm here to help you. I'm just trying to protect you. You do the opposite of that. You don't protect me at all. You make my, my things go much worse. Well, I'm in you, your brain. You need to just shut up. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to shut up. I'm in your brain. Well, I'm going to ignore you then. It's okay if you stay in my brain, but I'm just going to ignore you. Wow. Congratulations, Holly. What did that feel like for you? So I'm glad you gave me permission to kind of get mad um, because when I let myself feel emotional about it and, and really separate what those thoughts do to me and recognize how detrimental they are, it, it helped me um, see how beneficial it would be to change. Okay, very good, thank you. When Holly was talking about, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore, that's clearly thought diffusion. When Holly's talking about, you're not right, and some clients will get into specific evidence, like when I went to this other meetup, people really enjoyed interacting with me. That's cognitive restructuring. Those are just labels. The point is, this is an exercise that many clients find helpful. <coughs> I generally wouldn't do it until after doing a worksheet, otherwise they could get stuck in it. And also, I would start gently, because I want to make sure that they're stronger than me, and gradually get more and more forceful as I'm sensing that the client is really getting into this. Another type of cognitive restructuring can be done through imagery. And so Holly and I will do another exercise. Holly, you've been telling me that when you're socially anxious, whether you're in the situation like a meetup or a staff meeting, or you're thinking about one coming up, that you have these images that come to mind that are really disturbing. Yes, I do. I'm gonna ask you to imagine going to this meetup that you're considering going to this weekend. So close your eyes and initially set the scene. I know you haven't been there yet, but just imagine what the room might look like. Okay. And imagine the people that are there. 
play the scene out with your eyes closed and describe to me what you're seeing now in the present in your image. Okay. I, um, I see myself walking into a room. I see myself stop as I enter because I don't know where to go. I see other groups, like six different groups of people, two or three people all talking with each other. I see them having fun. I see myself standing by myself and looking awkward. Um, I, I see myself walking up to a group and attempting to enter the conversation. I see them kind of glance at me, but then look away quickly. Um, I, see, I, I see them kind of snickering with each other. And I, then I see myself sort of backing away and wandering off. Thank you, Holly. Open your eyes, please. And how are you feeling when you have this image? First, really anxious, and, but then really sad. And what are you sad about? Being rejected. I see. Now, what I'd like you to do is to do this image again, but this time imagine, act as if, you are self-confident. Self-confident doesn't mean you know that other people will react positively to you. Self-confident means believing in yourself. Okay. So close your eyes. Okay. And describe to me this second version of the image of the self-confident Holly. Okay. So I see myself maybe standing a little bit taller, a little bit straighter. I see myself not waiting so long to try to enter a group. I see myself walking up to a group. Um, I see that when I, you know, I try to enter the group and talk with them, they kind of let me join the group. I see them looking at each other still. And, but I still see myself walking away um, and not staying and talking. But I think, but I, but I, I walk away and, and I, I think I'm okay. I, I see myself trying an, another group. What do you do there? So I try again. Um, I see myself say, going up to, up to the group and trying to enter that group and I see them letting me join. And then I, then I see myself, you know, talking, talking with them. And I see a circle of people that I'm a part of. Very nice. Thank you, Holly. Open your eyes. How did this second image feel for you and go for you differently than the first image, if at all? So I was literally trying to imagine it like somebody else, you know, like because somebody that's confident and somebody that can actually do those things. And, and so I could envision something, you know, a different outcome and, and somebody could actually, you know, be okay with kind of being rejected by the first group and then be okay with trying again. Okay, and did it feel different for you the second time than the first time? It did, it did. Even though I was just imagining it, it just, I felt like I had, was kind of giving myself permission to, to try, you know, to, to be more confident and to try more things. So what we just did here is a form of cognitive restructuring, just like the worksheet. The worksheet was in words, this was in images. And you might want to practice this before you go to that meetup. Practice feeling confident. Notice you're not practicing what you're going to say. That's scripting, that's a safety-seeking behavior, it's unhelpful. You're just practicing feeling and acting with self-confidence. Okay, okay. 
Sounds good, thank you. I also want to mention there's something I call a pride and gratitude log. It's an expansion of the very common therapy practice of a gratitude journal. I call it a log because it sounds shorter and easier for people, but it's still a gratitude journal. I have a handout that I use for clients that describes how to do it. The pride piece is to get at the issue of shame. So people are not just writing down what they are grateful for in the past 24 hours, but they're also identifying what does that say about me? If it's something that they did, so if one of their entries is, I had a five minute conversation with a coworker, and the second question, and that's <coughs> something that they're grateful for, and then the second question is, what does that say about you? What underlying qualities does this illustrate of you? The client might answer that I'm a pretty good conversationalist if I focus mindfully, that at least some people seem to enjoy talking to me <coughs> when I focus mindfully. The next strategy we're looking at is conducting experiments. This is where it all comes together. External mindfulness and thought diffusion, cognitive restructuring, later we'll be talking about assertiveness as well as core belief work. It all comes together in doing experiments. The experiments are aimed at helping us increase our sense of being able to cope, as well as decrease our belief in the likelihood and severity of negative consequences. A debate, of course, is should experiments be aimed at habituation or learning? Guess, I'm for both, but first learning, then anxiety reduction. In fact, I use the word experiment rather than the traditional word exposure, because usually the word exposure is used in a habituation model. We expose ourselves to an anxiety trigger long enough for the anxiety to go down. And there's increasing evidence in exposure therapy that, that that habituation within a single exposure is not necessary. And of course, acceptance and commitment therapy would say that measuring your anxiety at every minute intervals would actually keep you focused on your anxiety rather than focus mindfully on the valued activity itself. And I fully agree with that. And so, in my belief, initially experiments are aimed at learning, specifically learning that our hot thoughts are distorted, <coughs> later learning that our underlying core beliefs are distorted. And ultimately learning that we can handle situations, including when somebody rejects us or seems uninterested in talking to us that we can handle those better than we initially believe. But ultimately, in my belief, experiments are also aimed at decreasing anxiety, but that's not the immediate goal in a given experiment. It's the longer term goal over time. Because of that, it's important how we choose experiments. First of all, I want to suggest we do not assign experiments. It always rankles me when I hear <coughs> cognitive behavioral therapists or other therapists talk about assigning homework. To me, the word assign is verboten in therapy. I suggest homework. Often the client suggests his or her own homework, including experiments to conduct. And we design the experiments, especially initially, by seeking out ways to test their hot thoughts and later on their underlying beliefs. Their hot thoughts being the prediction of how it will go, how other people will react, but also how they will be. And we'll get to the underlying core beliefs later, but that's another reason to conduct experiments. One thing that CBT therapists often neglect to stress, I, I assume they all believe, but I really want to stress, it's important to choose experiments according to the client's goals. Or as acceptance and commitment therapy practitioners would say, according to their values. I tend to think of it more as goals, but honestly I think they overlap greatly. 
So some clients may be seeing you to work on making friends, to work on dating, to work on using public bathrooms, to work on speaking up at staff meetings, to work on being sexual, to work on stage performing. There's a whole variety of goals. Here are some examples. Obviously, we don't want to choose experiments simply to test their hot thoughts whenever possible, which is honestly about 95% of the time. We want to choose experiments that help clients get closer to their therapy goals. There's some debate on the use of fear hierarchies, certainly in traditional exposure therapy, graduated exposure. The use of hierarchies is a core element so that you're having clients gradually work their way up their fear hierarchies, starting exposures, experiments with things that are only a little bit difficult, gradually getting to things that are harder and harder for them. In modern exposure therapy, it's, you know, like by Michelle Kraske and John Abramovitz, they teach that actually jumping around, doing things that are relatively easy and relatively hard, <laughs> jumping all over the place among their fears, actually helps learning better, helps habituation better. Actually, they would stress habituation is not the point learning is. I tend to agree with that, although hierarchies have a limited use, above all, to get clients to do their homework, because if they don't do the therapy experiments they chose for themselves, they're not learning anything other than <laughs> how to avoid, and they're already expert at avoiding. And so mainly, the way I use hierarchies is I ask a client what they want to do as a therapy experiment this week, or I suggest one to them, and if they tell me that that just feels w too hard, too difficult, when I ask them, what's your likelihood of actually following through and doing this, I ask them, what would be an easier version of that? So maybe if your goal is to not have a 15-minute conversation and to get a phone number, maybe if your goal is to just have a few-minute conversation with a few people, or maybe if your goal is to not go to this meetup but to go to that other meetup you've already been to, it might be easier for you. So that's using a fair hierarchy, but in a looser, less rigid sense. There's another debate as to what types of experiments to do. Straightforward experiments where a client is working directly on their goals. So it might be gradually talking with people more and more and learning how to have more enjoyable conversations and ultimately working on the longer term goal of making friends. But there are also what I call paradoxical experiments. Some practitioners call them shame attacking experiments or social mishap experiments or decatastrophizing experiments where paradoxically the goal is to try to bring about your fear. So if they're afraid of embarrassing themselves, the experiment might be to say something foolish on purpose, to ask a stupid question on purpose, to maybe go into a supermarket and stand by the dairy counter and ask a series of customers as they go by, could you tell me where the milk is? Or if they're goal is to overcome their anxiety about appearing anxious. They might go out of their way and create anxiety symptoms in a more exaggerated way, like get themselves to blush, whether it's using vitamin B, which often has blushing as a side effect, or running in place before the experiment, which might cause blushing, or maybe even putting on rouge to create artificial blushing, <laughs> and to do experiments in which you are exposing the appearance of blushing. And so there's debate on whether straightforward or paradoxical experiments are most useful. Generally what I do is start with straightforward experiments because paradoxical ones tend to be super scary for people, but then introduce paradoxical experiments later, slowly. I have found, paradoxically, that some clients, once they get into it, 
find paradoxical experiments to be much easier because there are some clients who just enjoy being silly on purpose when they're acting. I have a current client who's done a lot of improv. Improv is sometimes used as social anxiety treatment, primarily for exposure purposes. This is a client who does professional improv frequently. He's very comfortable being an actor. And those kind of experiments aren't very useful for him, whereas for other people they would be very useful. Whereas for him, the straightforward experiments of talking to someone, especially that he's attracted to, are much more challenging. Another debate, which is sort of between the acceptance and commitment world and I don't even know exactly what you call it, but the Reed Wilson world, which, and he calls his anxiety strategy, and it's, it's a tremendous thing. If you ever have an opportunity, I think he's later today, I'm not sure, but it, somewhere in this conference, do attend one of his workshops. <coughs> he calls his approach acceptance and commitment therapy on steroids, so you're not just accepting your anxiety or embracing your anxiety, but you're defying it. You're treating it like an opponent. I find that initially I start with the gentler approach and whenever possible I introduce and if a client seems to like it, work with the Reed Wilson approach where we're defying the anxiety. I want to do this thing that makes me feel anxious because this will get me from where I am now to where I want to be in life. I defy you anxiety to stop me from doing what is important for me. Now all these are versions of thought diffusion, but it's in a very aggressive way compared to the usual gentle way that is normally taught in acceptance and commitment therapy. So I start with a gentler approach and work toward the more aggressive approach if a client seems to uh, uh, find that helpful. <laughs> and then there's a bit of a debate, although not very controversial, about in-session versus homework experiments. They're both crucial. I usually start experiments in session. So for example, the conversation that Holly and I did earlier on is an example of an in-session experiment. We can do role plays where I pretend to be a stranger and she practices talking to me and initially I might be a friendly stranger and later I might be a socially anxious stranger and later I might be an overtly critical stranger. And also doing experiments in vivo, I call those field trips, going out of the office it usually means into <laughs> the world and talking with actual strangers. I especially enjoy doing that in my groups where we have whole sessions in public settings where there are lots of strangers and we meet in a coffee shop, divide up into pairs and go out and interact and come back and talk about it, then go out and interact again. But you could also do that in individual therapy in a given session. They're both useful. There's also other ways of doing in-session exposure imagery, which we already demonstrated, virtual reality that I don't have personal experience <coughs> in using only because it's so expensive, but from what I'm seeing of other people using, it has some benefit. There's some good virtual reality programs for public speaking and, e and a more limited number for social interaction. But those are really aimed at being initial steps before a client does it in real life as homework. I often will use a video recording of clients doing an experiment in session if they are agreeable, and they aren't all, but if they're agreeable, and then we discuss the video afterwards, and we use a video evidence worksheet where you're asking yourself a series of questions before watching the video, after doing the experiment. So it might be a conversation with me as though I were a stranger, and then before watching the video, they fill out a worksheet in which they're identifying how do you think you came across, how much do you think you blushed or jittered, how well do you think you were able to say what you wanted to say, et cetera. 
Then they watch the video and I encourage them to watch it two or three times mindfully, meaning with curiosity and not judgment, almost as though they were watching a video of another person rather than of themselves. And then we go through and fill out those questions again and usually, but not always, what they see is that they came across much better than they think, that they didn't blush nearly as much as they thought. They thought they would be beet red, but they were only slightly pink. They thought they would be really hesitant in conversation, but they were actually more fluid. Usually that's what people see. Not always. Sometimes what they see is, gee, I'm really avoiding eye contact. I didn't realize that I was doing that so much. But that's useful too, as long as they don't start beating themselves up about that. So video uh, evidence is a useful way of doing experiments in session. When doing experiments, it's important to limit the use of safety-seeking behaviors, which includes first and foremost avoidance. There's a number of ways to introduce that to clients. Mainly, I teach them that safety-seeking behaviors are crutches. Something that might be useful to do a little bit here and there, but if we rely on a crutch too much, I ask a client, what happens? And they could all say, well, I'm weaker. I don't have strength that way, that we need to gradually rely on the crutch less and less. I also teach clients that safety-seeking behaviors are false friends enemies is what they are in the guise of friends. <coughs> False friends, because although they temporarily may reduce our anxiety, they make us pay for it dearly later on. Because every time we avoid doing something, or maybe we do it but relying on safety-seeking behaviors, although it may lessen our anxiety now, it increases our beliefs in the hot thoughts that led us to avoid or rely on the safety-seeking behavior. So we pay for a little relief that's very temporary with more anxiety later. And most clients are able to see that by asking them about real-life experiences in which they relied on avoidance and other safety-seeking behaviors. I also help them see that safety-seeking behaviors make it harder to build self-confidence. I'll often tell clients, Self-confidence is the opposite of social anxiety, more or less. But if we're relying heavily on safety-seeking behaviors, our confidence goes in the behavior, not in ourselves. So if we drink in order to lessen our anxiety, which is a super common socially anxious safety-seeking behavior, or for that matter, used something prescribed by our doctor, like propranolol or Xanax, <coughs> that although that medication or drug probably did reduce our anxiety, what we learned is that the medication or drug reduced our anxiety. We didn't learn self-confidence usually. As one client told me, my confidence is in the bottle, not in myself. These are various ways to identify safety-seeking behaviors. Mainly, I ask clients when describing a social anxiety trigger to tell me what did you do or avoid doing before, during, or after the trigger. It's not always during. It could be before and even after. What did you do or avoid doing to try to feel less anxious or to try to make things go better for you? And usually clients are able to identify a number of things but they rarely identify internal mental behavior, so I ask them about that explicitly. What are you paying attention to? And typically they are self-monitoring, which is a safety-seeking behavior in which if they're afraid that their anxiety will show, it's quite logical but terribly unhelpful that they would monitor their symptoms to see, am I blushing, am I jittery? But but by paying attention to that internal evidence, it feels bigger than it really is, and they imagine it's showing more, plus they're making themselves more anxious, so it fuels a vicious cycle. 
or they may be self-critiquing, I can't believe I said that, that was something so stupid, or scripting, I don't know what to say next, I'm desperately trying to think of the next thing to say, I can't think of anything to say. Well, that's because you're not paying attention to what's being said now. You're in your head trying to script something that you're not fully listening to. Or even the use of medications that are prescribed by doctors. This is especially true of PRN medications like propranolol, which is often used for performance anxiety, such as public speaking fear or actual stage performance, or benzodiazepines or alcohol. Not that that's prescribed by doctors, but those sort of fast-acting medications tend to inhibit learning and put our self-confidence in the drug, not in our cells. There's a bit of a debate as to whether social anxiety is caused by social <laughs> skill deficit versus safe Oh, I'm sorry, it's not what is, it's caught. There's a debate whether people with social anxiety have a social skill deficit or the problem is that they're relying on safety-seeking behaviors. In this case, I come pretty strongly on the side of safety-seeking behaviors. Evidence shows that most people with social anxiety, with the exception of people on the autism spectrum, of course, but most other folks, tend to have social skills in the normal range when they are not anxious. The problem is when they are socially anxious, they tend to rely not on their skills, but on their safety-seeking behaviors, which make them appear unskilled. This is an important distinction because many socially anxious people have the core belief, which we'll get to in a bit, that they are socially inept. And one of the problems of teaching social skills to a socially anxious person is that we could unintentionally be reinforcing the core belief that they're socially inept. So I frame it with clients that these are safety-seeking behaviors that we want to eliminate or at least greatly reduce. And occasionally, here's the synthesis, synthesis part, occasionally there is a social skill deficit. It's usually in very specific areas because of heavy reliance on avoidance. Like they may have no clue how to enter a group conversation at a social event because they've never done that. So we talk about ways, but usually I'll ask them, what do you think are different ways you can do it? What are the pros and cons? Rather than my telling them how to do it, <coughs> because again, I don't want to foster the sense that they're unskilled, I'll obviously give them ideas as needed, but typically they're able to come up with ideas on their own if they come up with an idea that I think is self-defeating rather than disagreeing with them, I might ask them what are the pros and cons of doing it that way versus the other way that we talked about. So occasionally I do instruct clients in social skills and we practice them in role plays. But when we do that, we talk about this as an alternative to your safety-seeking behavior. I don't want to reinforce the idea that they're deficient. There's a bit of a debate, do we aim toward totally eliminating, in fact, require totally eliminating safety-seeking behaviors when doing exposures? Or do we gradually reduce them? And although ultimately learning is greater when they're not relying on safety-seeking behaviors at all, if not relying on safety-seeking behaviors at all means they avoid, which is another safety-seeking behavior, they're not learning anything useful. So basically, my synthesis is when they've chosen an experiment to do and we've identified the safety-seeking behaviors that they typically rely on, we talk about eliminating those behaviors. And if the client is open to it, I go for that. Elimination is certainly better. But if they're saying, I'm, I'm a, I don't know that I could give this presentation at, at my work meeting without preparing for four hours for this five minute presentation, I ask them, okay, how much are you willing to cut back on that? And it might be initially they say, okay, I'm willing to cut back to three hours, which isn't much, but it, for them it does feel like much. So when the client isn't willing to totally eliminate a safety seeking behavior, I work toward reducing it in a level that they are willing to try and then gradually reducing it further. 
Another debate is whether certain things that we teach clients are safety-seeking behaviors, whether it's medications that are prescribed by doctors, especially the PRN medications I've mentioned, whether preparation for doing public speaking or other kinds of performance is a safety-seeking behavior or perfectly rational. At some point, socially anxious clients are really over-preparing, spending many hours more than other people would. For that matter, is doing cognitive restructuring a safety-seeking behavior? Is doing imagery a safety-seeking behavior? Is mindfulness a safety-seeking behavior? Is depending how we define things, we could say yes to all of those. The bottom line is, to what degree is this helping or hindering learning? And it depends on the client. Before doing experiments, <coughs> there are a number of things to do. There's a long version and a short version. In the long version, I would help have them fill out a cognitive restructuring worksheet in which they're identifying not only a different way of thinking, but behavioral goals they want to work on. But there's also a short version. Rather than doing cognitive restructuring first, they might fill out an experiment worksheet, the first three rows before the experiment, where they're not challenging their hot thoughts, they're just identifying <laughs> the hot thoughts and identifying the behavioral goals. Before an experiment, there's a great deal of worry and dread that some clients have about doing an experiment. If that's the case, using imagery can be very helpful for them. Doing cognitive restructuring before an experiment could be helpful for those clients who do a great deal of worry and dread. But also mindfulness and thought diffusion where they're focusing on valued activities rather than focusing on their worries can be helpful. During experiments, the main thing is to focus mindfully externally on the person, the conversation, the activity as I've been emphasizing as well as to work on their goals. The interesting thing is some clients are so focused on their goals, like I gotta be mindful, I gotta say hello to five people, I gotta have at least one five minute conversation. Although those are all constructive goals, if they're focusing on the goals, they're not being mindful. So I encourage people to remind themselves of what the goals are before the experiment, but during the experiment to focus on the interaction itself. And also I encourage clients to affirm themselves after experiments. To say, that was great, I really did well then, I want to try again. Or this didn't go so well this time, I'm going to try this person, maybe that person will be friendlier, as opposed to I blew it this time, maybe I'll do better next time. After doing experiments in the long version, there is a post-experiment worksheet which helps a client analyze how they help themselves, how they unintentionally hurt themselves, what's the evidence they gathered from the experiment that counters or maybe supports their hot thoughts and what can they learn going forward from the experiment. If they're doing the short version, in other words, they filled out not the cognitive restructuring worksheet but just the first part of the experiment worksheet before an experiment, afterwards it's just two more columns where they identify the evidence and what was learned. So generally I start with the short version where cognitive restructuring comes first and as I said earlier, move as quickly as a client feels able to the short version, partly because they get tired of doing cognitive restructuring but also because ultimately they don't need it so much. After experiments, there's a tendency for many clients to ruminate about the imperfection, even in an experiment that you think went really well, they might focus on the 5% that didn't go well, or maybe it was, well, it was good, but in their mind it wasn't good, and ruminate about that, beat themselves up. 
So there's a number of things that you can do to help combat post-event rumination. I like to call it being a good parent or if you prefer being a good friend to yourself. So not the kind of parent whose elementary school age kid comes home and I use this analogy with clients and their kid says to them, look at this project I did in school, dad. And imagine that the parent responds, well, that wasn't so good. Your mother will be very disappointed. And the other kids in class, I bet they did better. But that's the kind of thing socially anxious clients say to ourselves. And I use that analogy with them to help them see how their rumination hurts them. And being a good parent or a good friend, the analogy would be imagine that the parent said, hey, that was really good. I'm really proud of you. I'm really proud that you did A, B, and C. That's really a big step forward. And maybe next time, why don't you try also doing D? So the good parent is not just affirming the positive, but they might be suggesting something they would want to try to make further progress. But they're not beating themselves up. They're not beating the client up. They are affirming the positive of what they did and identifying any steps they want to take next time to make further progress. The pride and gratitude log, which I mentioned earlier, is also another way to stop post-experiment rumination because in a written form, they're writing down the positive things that they did and the positive underlying qualities about themselves. Then there's that sticky issue of follow through. A brilliant experiment idea is useless if the client doesn't do it. So there's a number of things you can do to increase the likelihood of clients following through. As I said earlier, make sure that you're not assigning an experiment but you're suggesting one. Whenever possible, encourage the client to suggest their own experiment so they have more buy-in. Ask the client, how likely are you to do this experiment that you've chosen? And if they say anything less than maybe 90%, then more work is needed. Maybe it's identifying some obstacles that you can problem solve around, like they won't remember, or it might get rained out. More likely, they're going to identify their fears, will tell them to don't do it, or to do it but rely on these safety-seeking behaviors. And so using imagery of doing the experiment, doing role plays, of the experiment itself, if that's possible, or going out of the office with the client and doing experiments together with them. So like going to a store, if their, if their homework experiment is talking to strangers at a meetup, I mean, there's not a meetup outside of my office, but there are stores. And so I might go to a store with a client, usually I plan this in advance because they aren't right near me, and initially, I might do the experiments on my own, excuse me, together with the client, but I might be the one doing the experiment of talking to strangers. But then they do it, initially with me by their side and then with me off, not <laughs> being directly with them. So doing experiments in session or in the field as part of a session is one way to greatly increase the likelihood of them following through and doing it as homework. Having homework buddies and group, I actually pair people up in rotating pairs where they talk to each other every week, which is in itself a home, uh, an experiment, especially phone conversations for many socially anxious people are big triggers. But also they're talking to each other about their homework and encouraging each other, maybe doing experiments together. But even outside of group, they could have homework buddies. If there's a good friend that they could be open to of saying, I want to report to you tomorrow about whether or not I went to that meetup and tell you how it went. 
And in a way, what you're doing is you're using their social anxiety to get them to do the experiment. It's temporarily a safety-seeking behavior, but if you do it temporarily and it helps them start doing experiments, then they could do experiments on their own without reporting to a friend. Or occasionally, if they say, I have no friends that I can open up to, which actually is more than occasional, and they feel like they need to report to somebody, they might report to me by email. But again, that's a temporary measure. One technique that I use occasionally, um, and it's almost always helpful when I do, comes from trial-based cognitive therapy. And that's in the resources page in an earlier slide, where you're using a series of role plays to do cognitive behavioral therapy, not necessarily for social anxiety, but including social anxiety. And one of those role plays is called a consensual role play. Not in the sense that the client consents to it. All of these are consensual in that sense, of course. But consensual in that you're aiming toward bringing a consensus between their feelings and their thoughts, their emotional side and their intellectual side. So Holly and I will demonstrate that. So Holly, you've chosen an idea for an experiment of going back to the meetup you've been to several times now, and you're really wanting to share your contact information out and invite somebody out, and you have a couple people in mind whom you <coughs> enjoy talking to recently. Did I understand that right? Yeah, that's right. But you've also told me that you're not so sure that you're going to have the nerve to do that? Yes, I want to try, but the likelihood of my actually doing it is pretty low right now. Yeah. And we did cognitive restructuring on it, which she said helped you a little, but not enough. So there's an interesting experiment, a role play that we can do, where we are breaking you up into two different people, so to speak, temporarily, where in that chair, you are being your intellectual side, the side of you that wants to do this experiment because it's an important value of yours to make friends, and you know that there's at least a possibility that you'll be able to do that here. And when you're in this chair, you're being your emotional self, where you're saying, well, yeah, I believe that, sort of, but I'm just too scared to do it. What if it doesn't go well? And I'll, I'll be behind you, giving you a little bit of guidance. You'll be going back and forth, because these are both part of you. I'd like you to address yourself in the other chair as Holly. They're both parts of you. And you're having a discussion. This is not an argument like we've done before between hot thoughts and your constructive attitude. This is a more compassionate, caring discussion in which you're trying to bring together your emotional and your intellectual <laughs> self because they're both equally important parts of you. You want to give that a try? OK, so this side is trying to convince the other side that it would be a good thing to go with compassion, absolutely, but okay. with compassion and understanding. Okay. Okay. So looking, so you're the intellectual side, looking at your emotional side as though you were in that chair. What I'd like you to do is to explain to Holly why you, you think it would be a good idea for you to go back to the meetup and to share contact information and ask her out. So Holly, you know, remember what the goals that we set originally, um, that, that you set originally about really trying to go outside your comfort zone, meet more people, and develop some friendships. And the meetups have been going really well for you. You've done a great job there, and you've learned a lot of new skills. So we, we want to try to push you, Holly, to, to to uh, actually exchange information with someone, um, you know, get their phone number and see if they'd be interested in doing something outside of the meetup. Okay, very good. Switch seats. You're now your emotional self responding back why you don't want to do this. So Holly, that sounds great, but there's no way I'm doing that. I, that just, just, just the thought of it when I hear you say, oh my God, I'm just gonna walk up to somebody and say, oh, give me your phone number. There's, there's no way I can do that. I'll just be a sweaty mess. 
I, I'll be anxious, I'll get rejected, and it'll be a horrible, horrible experience for me. I just can't do it. Thank you. Switch chairs and respond with compassion and understanding to emotional Holly. So Holly, I hear your fears, and I think that um, if you can try to remember the experiences that you have had and how positive that they've been, remember all of your new skills and try to use some of the uh, concepts that Larry has taught you in terms of letting go of those, those negative thoughts and you know, really try to ignore the emotion and focus on the overall goal and how great it'll be when you go up and actually introduce yourself and can set up something outside of the meetup. Very good, switch chairs. I can't do it, they're just gonna say no. I'll probably walk up to like, I'll probably like walk up to five different people and they'll go, who is that weirdo? You know, no, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna go with you somewhere. I just, I think that, I just don't know. I just, this feeling of being rejected, it's that's, that's now that's all I can focus on. Cause when I get myself to think, okay, I can make myself do it. Like actually say, oh, I'll walk up to somebody, but then what am I gonna do when they say no? Switch. Why don't you tell emotional Holly how you would feel about yourself for having asked people out, regardless of whether the person says yes or no. That part isn't in your control. What's in your control is asking someone out. Their response, you hope for a yes, but that may not happen. So why don't you tell emotional Holly how you imagine you would feel for asking people out? So Holly, you actually make a good point um, that you may get rejected. I mean, you may try a few people and they may say no, but think about how, like, think about how you're gonna feel after you actually make the attempt. You know, I mean, I think that that's, that, that, is, that feeling is gonna be such a positive emotion for you. How do you imagine you would feel? I, I yeah, I mean, just like really proud of myself. Even if the person says no? Yeah, because I think what that means is that I had, I had the uh, courage to actually go do it, and then I, I was okay. I, I, you know, if someone says no, I'm still gonna be okay. I'd be really proud of myself. Okay, so let me ask you now, how are you feeling about going and sharing contact information with somebody? So I'm still reluctant to do it. This, it was a beneficial exercise because I was able to kind of hear myself being silly about you know, not wanting to do it and then hear myself being way more rational and, and, and identifying why it would be a really good thing. I'm still nervous about it, but I think it definitely increased my likelihood of doing it some. So before you said your likelihood was only about 20%. What do yeah. you think it is now? Yeah, it's, it's higher. I mean, it's definitely higher. Like, you know, I don't know if we're at 50-50 yet, but you know, it's, it's, it's like 30-35%. This is an exercise that tends to help, and if it doesn't help enough, I would then look for an easier experiment for the client to do and to do the harder one later when they're more ready, okay? Briefly, I want to mention that another type of an experiment that I use only occasionally are conducting surveys. Since the thing that clients with social anxiety are afraid of is often invisible, what people are thinking of them, surveys are a way of making the invisible visible. The problem is I usually have to do this for the client, I might be doing it together with the client by my side. In my experience, it's a rare client who will do it themselves, but nonetheless, it's still very helpful. So if they're afraid that someone is gonna see that they can't pee at a urinal for 30 seconds, or they're afraid that someone is gonna see that they're blushing during a conversation, 
We might conduct a survey either through email. I've contacted my group of local friends any number of times with these surveys anonymously or going to an area where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and asking a series of people some questions that the client identified beforehand to ask. <coughs> like, what do you think when you notice someone blushing? What do you think when you notice somebody at a urinal who doesn't seem to be able to urinate right away? And writing down the responses, or if it's done by email, you already have it written down and then discussing the results afterwards with the client. Also, David M. Clark in Britain has done a good number of these surveys in England and has these online. And so if some of these surveys are relevant to a client, simply watching those videos might be help for the, helpful for the client as well. They'll see a variety of responses, but it will often give them evidence that the way people think is more compassionate or I don't care is often the kind of response you get. I don't care if somebody takes 30 seconds to urinate, you think I would even notice? Mm -hmm. Or if somebody blushes, I just think, oh, they turn red and I don't really care. So you get a variety of responses. Another technique that is useful that is fostered principally by Christine Tedeschi, who's a fantastic trainer, um, is the use of assertion. She calls it assertive <coughs> defense of the self. I call it head held high assertions. The premise is that because a client fears their thing, their concern may come true, that somebody may think badly of them or react badly to them, that doing cognitive restructuring, which may lessen their belief in the likelihood of that fear coming true, is useful but not enough because they may think even if it only happens one out of a hundred times, it would just be so horrible if it were to happen. But there's a good deal of debate as to how useful this strategy is. I use it with most of my clients and I find that some find it useful and many don't, but since some find it useful and I can't predict <coughs> whom, I introduce it to most of my clients. Many clients will tell me, I don't believe that someone would actually say this if their fear is that somebody would think, you know, I'm unattractive or I look weak because I'm nervous, that I think it's really unlikely someone would say it. Or they might even tell me, if somebody were to say that, I wouldn't care so much because that would mean this person's really rude. And I don't care what rude people think, I care what polite people think about me. So for some clients, this is of limited use. But nonetheless, I do introduce it to people because it's quite <coughs> helpful for some people. Another limitation is that even if a client finds it useful in theory, that in real life, often there's no opportunity to assert themselves. So if somebody says, I'm not finding this conversation interesting and they walk away, it's not realistic to have the client run after that person and say, but wait a minute, other people find me interesting. So there are, there's limitation to our ability to actually use this technique, but again, some clients find it very helpful, so I do introduce it. And these are the ways to go about carrying it out. Basically, there's a handout that I'll show you in a minute uh, where clients write down what some of their fears are. And these are examples of what I call head held high, meaning non-defensive, non-aggressive assertions. And so a client might do that as homework or do it together <coughs> in session. And then once they've come up with some identified fears and assertions, we start practicing these in a series of role plays. Initially, the role plays are rather scripted, and I want to acknowledge scripting is a safety-seeking behavior, so it's only initially. And then gradually, as the client gets more and more confident in asserting herself, we go toward tougher role plays 
which are not scripted, in which I'm presenting the fear come true in a way that's somewhat different than they anticipated, so they need to think on their feet. Hi, Larry. So I've got an idea for today that I want to run by you and see what you think. Okay. Remember when we were practicing the assertion technique? Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you really liked that. If I remember uh, your input on that. That's right. Yeah, and you're actually very good at it. Yeah. So what I'm thinking now is maybe we take it up a notch. And so I will, I will play the rude stranger and you're going to respond to me, but I'm going to be outrageously rude to you. You were already pretty rude the last time. Wait till you hear this. <laughs> okay, I just hope I don't get stuck. Yeah. And that's okay. If you get stuck, you know, we, you know, we can, but I think, you, I think you can do it. Okay. I think you can do this. Okay. Okay. So I'm having a conversation with you. Right. Okay. Right. So we're going to pretend. So I'm, I'm the rude stranger. And then you remember the assertion techniques that we talked about. Yeah. So yeah. you respond to me. Okay. Okay. Um, you look really nervous. Well, I am a little bit nervous. You know, I get a little nervous when I talk to strangers. Perfectly you're, normal. You're blushing. Well, you know, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm light complected. My, my ancestors are from Northern Europe. We blush. I'm not really sure what's wrong with you. you your, your whole body is shaking and you're, you're, just, you're just like a weird person. No, I'm not a weird person. I'm an imperfect person. I'm actually a very kind and compassionate person, and I would never think to criticize people I harshly. I don't have to stand here and talk to you very long, because this is really uncomfortable. I think people are looking at me going, is she like with that weird guy? It sounds like you have a social anxiety problem. I could suggest, <laughs> I could suggest a therapist for you to talk to. But that's actually okay because I understand what it's like and I'm actually here to make friends and it doesn't seem oh like Oh my god, there's no way you have any friends at all. I can't even imagine. Well, I do have friends but not enough, but I don't think you're a good candidate for one so I'm going to I'm going to excuse myself and go talk to someone else who hopefully will be friendlier than you've been. Larry, that was fantastic. <laughs> really fantastic. <laughs> so again, this is very fun in session. And you start with relatively easy, fairly scripted versions of this role play and get to harder ones. However, in my experience, it's of great use for some clients, of limited use for most, but it's certainly worth a try. There are other ways to approach this. You can do this in imagery, which we're not going to demonstrate here, but imagining a stranger reacting very negatively and imagining yourself responding with self-confidence to that stranger. And this is intended to be followed up by doing experiments, above all paradoxical <laughs> or decatastrophizing experiments, in which you're trying to provoke a negative response. So I've had clients who are afraid of appearing foolish go to some obvious setting like standing by the base of the Washington Monument, which is like 50 stories high, by the way, and asking a series of people, could you tell me where the Washington Monument is? And getting a variety of responses. And in the rare instance, and it is pretty rare, that somebody then laughs at them or criticizes them, they then have a scripted response, an assertion to use ahead of time, like, oops, that's silly of me. That's kind of a silly question, but I guess we all ask silly questions from time to time, don't we? So it's sort of a friendly assertion. There's the possibility of doing proactive assertions. I have mixed feelings about this. By proactive, I mean you don't wait for a stranger to criticize you because actually that tends not to happen very much. But you can bring up an assertion ahead of time because you're thinking that the stranger might be thinking negatively of you. So a good example I had of doing this with a client was somebody who was afraid of blushing. She actually was a fairly extroverted person with social anxiety about blushing. So we went to a store during session. And initially, I did this a couple times with her by my side. And then she did it. And she walked up to a series of customers, or in some cases, store uh, staff, 
ask them something or another about a product in the store, and then out of the blue, or out of the red, would say to the client, oh, don't mind me, I blush easily, it's just part of my heritage. And then would go on with the discussion. And we did that with, in a single session with something like 20 different people, and then afterwards met to discuss what were the reactions. And overwhelmingly, people would say things like, I didn't notice, or I don't care. Paradoxically, her saying this would usually bring upon blushing, even though she wasn't blushing at first. But if we wanted to, she could have taken vitamin B or run in place to create blushing or worn rouge. There was one or two people that responded sort of negatively. And it actually made us laugh, which I kind of felt bad about laughing at strangers with the stranger. That so, but nonetheless, they responded so negatively, it seemed unreal. Like someone said, I can't believe you said that. And it made us laugh. And then we talked about that afterwards, and we thought, well, that's just kind of a rude person. Who cares? That's them. So it was very helpful for her. The thing to watch out for with these proactive assertions is that they could come across as reassurance seeking, which is a big problem with all anxiety disorders, including to a lesser degree, but some socially anxious people do that as well. So we want to make sure that the way we approach this isn't a reassurance seeking way, it's more an evidence gathering way. <coughs> and this is a worksheet that I showed you earlier. Finally, an important element of social anxiety work, in my belief, is identifying underlying beliefs, core beliefs, that help cause the social anxiety, or at least exacerbate it in the first place. And working toward modifying them so that they are more realistic, helpful, and compassionate. Just like cognitive restructuring aims at modifying hot thoughts to be more realistic, helpful, and compassionate, so does core belief work. Now traditionally in CBT for social anxiety, well, in some approaches in CBT for social anxiety, there's no core belief work at all. But some practitioners, I, I like to in particular say David M. Clark, the British one, um, really emphasizes it. And it gets at shame in the way that all the other techniques are primarily targeted at anxiety. But remember, shame, the belief that somehow I'm fundamentally deficient. Core belief work gets at shame more effectively than the other strategies, too. Although the other strategies certainly whittle away at shame. And so this is a debate about whether or not to do core belief work. Generally, I start at the level of hot thoughts, automatic thoughts. But it's pretty common that socially anxious people, even when not asked, will identify as their hot thoughts, their core beliefs. I'm socially inept. People will reject me if I make a mistake. These are core beliefs. Oh, I do want to stress, I understand that in CBT, there's usually a couple levels distinguished underlying assumptions or conditional assumptions, if then, if I blush, people will reject me, or underlying core beliefs, I'm deficient and so people will reject me. I agree that there are those distinctions. I don't personally find it terribly helpful to emphasize those distinctions with clients, so I just call all of that core beliefs, but that's just my messier work. If you want to distinguish them, that's, that's fine. The main reason why I think it's important to do core belief work is because of the element of shame. This is not a simple <coughs> phobia. This is a shame-based disorder as much as it is an anxiety-based disorder for the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of people with social anxiety. There's an occasional client who feels really good about themselves generally, but they just think they're, they suck at public speaking, and so you could just work on that and not get the core beliefs but that, they're pretty rare. It's much more common that they think of themselves as fundamentally deficient. The major themes and core beliefs for social anxiety are a sense of deficiency, as I said, but also perfectionism. 
In fact, some research anyway shows that socially anxious people are not more perfectionistic about their own standards for themselves than the average person, but they are much more perfectionistic about what they believe other people's standards are for them. They believe that if they mess up a sentence in the middle of a conversation, or if they appear a little bit nervous, that other people will reject them because of that, even though they've seen other people mess up <coughs> sentences or occasionally bluss, and they don't reject them for that. So the perfectionism, as well as a sense of deficiency, much less commonly, but I do indicate it here because it sometimes happens, there's a sense of suspiciousness that if I let people get close to me, they're likely to hurt me. Now usually that relates to a belief about their own deficiency, but it also might relate to a belief about other people being malicious, or at least many other people being malicious. So these are themes of core beliefs in social anxiety disorder. These are some ways at identifying unhealthy core beliefs, and there are various handouts that go with it, questionnaires and worksheets. This is the same type of work that you would do in CBT for any problem where you want to get to underlying core beliefs, including peeling the onion called the downward arrow technique more traditionally. These are some ways of writing healthy new core beliefs. There's a handout that goes with that as well. Uh, but one is you could do cognitive restructuring with core beliefs, although that tends not to be so effective, but it, it's worth a try often. Often asking a client for a time in which they felt pretty good about how they handled challenging things, if they can identify such a time, and most clients, but not all clients can, and ask them during that time, during that best of time, what do you think your core beliefs were at that moment? And often they can identify sort of a minority voice in their head, a healthy alternative core belief that they sometimes have, but usually is not dominant. Or they can do that projecting forward in time. How would you like to be able to handle difficult, challenging situations in the future and have them describe that? I would like to be able to talk to anybody I want to, and if somebody is uninterested, I might be a little disappointed, but I would brush that off and go on and talk to somebody else and just not think about it again. And then I would ask them, so what would your core beliefs need to be for that to be true of you? And they might say, well, I have strengths and weaknesses like everyone else. And so as long as I'm focusing mindfully, some people will really like me for who I am, and if someone doesn't, <laughs> that's their loss, I'll move on and talk to someone else. So often imagining a confident future will help them identify a healthy new core belief. In some cases, they can identify people they admire. Maybe it's people they know, maybe it's famous people, and ask them, what are the qualities about that person that you admire about her or him? And what do you guess that person's core beliefs are? They probably don't know, but by guessing at their core beliefs, it might help them identify their own healthy alternative new core beliefs. These are just different ways of writing drafts of core beliefs. These are examples written by actual clients of mine, minus their names, of course, who gave me permission to pass these out among other clinicians and also other clients of healthy and unhealthy core beliefs that they've identified for themselves. You can read that on your own. It's in the handouts. And there's a variety of core belief change work that we can do. Most of these are, all of these actually are standard cognitive behavioral therapy strategies for core belief work. I'm just going to mention some of them. There are handouts that describe all of them in detail. And then Holly and I will demonstrate a couple of them that I find especially useful and kind of fun for socially anxious clients. First of all, and perhaps most importantly, 
we can conduct homework experiments to challenge core beliefs. So initially we're doing experiments to challenge hot thoughts, but later on we would identify what are the underlying core beliefs that are triggered when you make conversation with strangers, when you ask a stranger to share contact information. Not only what are the hot thoughts, but what are the underlying beliefs about yourself or beliefs about people that trigger your anxiety here, and then conduct experiments to challenge those core beliefs, to gather evidence related to the core beliefs and not only to the hot thoughts. And going back to the cognitive restructuring worksheet or to the short version experiment worksheet, in both cases it gives you the option of identifying the underlying core belief. You can also conduct a core belief action plan. Here's an example of a blank one and one filled out where the person has identified their unhealthy old core belief, their healthy new core belief, and the rules that the old belief tells them to do. Basically the do's and don'ts. My old core belief that I'm socially inept says I shouldn't talk to strangers. I should say very little when I do talk to new people so that I don't reveal my deficiencies. And then we would identify experiments to help them challenge those do's and don'ts, basically to do the opposite of them. Sometimes hierarchically if they're afraid to do it in scarier ways, but to do the opposite of what your core beliefs tell you to do. I call this defying old core beliefs or rebel experiments. It could also be called act as if experiments. Act as if you fully believe your new core beliefs in this experiment that you've chosen. How would you handle it if you fully believe the new core belief? So whether you're rebelling against the old core belief by doing the opposite of its do's and don'ts, or you're acting as if you fully believe the new core belief, <coughs> Those are ways of conducting experiments to challenge your old core beliefs. Gathering evidence. The pride and gratitude log is a good introduction to an evidence log, gathering evidence supporting your healthy new core beliefs and refuting old core beliefs. And again, there are handouts that describe all of that. Writing a flashcard where you're identifying not only the hot thought in a, in a challenging situation, in this case when somebody faces the possibility of rejection, but you're also identifying the underlying core belief that is triggered and how that affects your behavior and how you would want to handle that ahead of time. And having that flashcard on a file card or nowadays on your smartphone to look at occasionally and then to go out and do rebel experiments or act as if experiments using the flashcard ahead of time as a motivator. Here's the core belief action plan I showed you earlier. More core belief change techniques. Holly and I will demonstrate a core belief argument which is similar to the cognitive restructuring argument we did earlier. And notice in these arguments I'm encouraging the client to practice being assertive with me. And so this is a form of assertion different than the Podesky assertive defense of the self because we're doing this as role plays with the other side of herself rather than with a stranger. But it's still a form of assertiveness that helps increase self-confidence and decrease shame. So I'm back to playing the therapist and Holly is the client. So Holly, you've been doing some really good work in the last couple sessions identifying your unhealthy old core beliefs that make you socially anxious. Yeah. And also the healthy new core beliefs you want to aspire to that you find believable but you're not as fully believing at this point. Right. And that's perfectly normal because you've been living with the old core beliefs for many years and the healthy new core beliefs, not so much, maybe a few weeks. Right. Okay, so here's a, uh, an experiment I wanna suggest for you that might help. Remember a long time ago, we did 
a role play in which I was pretending to be your hot thoughts and you were arguing against that? Yeah, the one where I got angry? Yeah, yeah. and you shut me up. Right, right. And you shut me up using both your emotion, your anger, and also reason, telling me why you thought I was wrong. Okay. Or why you thought I was bad for you. Okay. We can do the same sort of argument, only this time instead of playing your hot thoughts, I'm going to play your underlying core beliefs that you've told me about in the last couple sessions. Okay. And your job is to shut me up again using both reason and emotion. Really go for it. Okay. Remember, I'm not me. I'm your unhealthy beliefs. Okay. Okay. I think you ought to stop going to therapy. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get you to do things that's going to reveal that you're socially inept, that people are going to inevitably reject you sooner or later. To the contrary, going to therapy has actually shown me that I'm not socially inept. And that there are many <laughs> other things that describe me, but socially inept is not one of them. But there have been people that you've talked to as therapy homework that, who didn't seem interested in talking to you. That obviously means you're inept. And exactly, exactly. Now, I've learned that, though. What I've learned is that if someone chooses not to speak with me or not to engage with me, I can handle it. And it says nothing about me at all, much more about that person. But if you weren't socially adept, the person wouldn't reject you. They would like you. Ah, but there's where you're wrong again. That's simply not true. If the person rejects me, that means nothing about me at all. It's, you know, it happens. It happens and I can handle it. I just don't, I don't believe you and I'm not going to listen to you not going to listen to me. I'm your protector. I'm here to protect you from pain. I'm it's not going been, anywhere. You've been in my head my entire life, and I've always believed what you've said, and it has been horrible for me. And I refuse to listen anymore. I don't believe you. I know you're wrong, and I am not socially inept. Well, I'm not going anywhere. As you say, I'm in your brain. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not shutting up. That's okay. That's okay. I don't have to listen to you. Congratulations. Of course, in a real session, this would go on longer than we would discuss it afterwards, what the client learned from that, and so forth. This is a combination of cognitive restructuring at the level of core beliefs, but also thought diffusion. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. That's thought diffusion. There's another core belief change technique that actually I learned pretty recently through David Clark, again, the British one. Oop called then versus now. And it comes from the premise that socially anxious clients have an image in their mind of how they come across and or an image of how other people react to them. Very negative and painful image, shame inducing and anxiety inducing image and that this image began earlier in life, typically in childhood or at least by adolescence. 95% of socially anxious people develop social anxiety disorder by adolescence. The median age is 13. So these images begin early. And it's aimed at learning how to separate the experience that created the image from the way things are now for them, how they're different and how people are different. Here are some worksheets that I use with socially anxious clients, identifying advantages and disadvantages of their core beliefs, which is standard CBT techniques, ways of identifying how people sometimes unintentionally reinforce their old core beliefs through various behaviors such as avoidance and safety seeking behaviors. <coughs> Holly and I will now discuss the then versus, excuse me, demonstrate the then versus now technique which he calls discrimination training. I don't like that phrase because it's not like we're teaching people to discriminate in the usual sense of the word, but nonetheless, then versus now is a good title for it. So you've been doing a lot of 
core belief work as well as homework experiments for a while now and have really made a lot of progress. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I've noticed, Holly, is that when you're socially anxious, that there's an image that enters your mind pretty often, regardless of the setting, the details vary a little bit, but the image is typically similar. Could you remind me what that image is? Yeah, I mean, every time I enter a social situation, I have this image of me trying to join a group. I see myself walking up and then I see being laughed at or rejected. Okay, and you've had that same or very similar image in quite a variety of settings. Yes. Now, Holly, can you think about the first time that you experienced something in life that created that image, or at least in which that image was dominated? And, and if you can't think of the first time, any early time when you first started having this image? Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it happened so long ago, I still, I can't believe I still remember it so vividly, but I think I was eight, I was in the third grade, and it was, it was a horrible experience. Would you be willing to do an a imagery exercise in which you remember what that was like for you? Okay. Okay, so close your eyes. <coughs> and picture the setting of the place that you were in when this occurred and the people who were there and describe to me what you are seeing. Okay, so um, I'm sitting in the back of a classroom I see myself in this, you know, student desk chair thing. Um, I look around the classroom and I see it's full of people. I see the teacher up front at her desk and I see her stand up and say, it's break time, um, you guys can go play at the stations. And then I see everyone getting up and going and forming groups. <coughs> and I see a group of girls that are playing together and I see myself walking over there and remembering I'm brand new and don't know anybody. I, I think I'm, I see myself reaching out and trying to join the group and I, I can still see all their faces where they looked at each other. I see them laughing and laughing and, and even somebody, one of them pointed at me and, and I, I just see myself kind of backing away and standing by myself. Okay, you can open your eyes. How are you feeling now, Holly? So, it, it still creates these, these horrible feelings of sadness for me and because it was so painful to be rejected like that. And indeed that image is similar to the kind of images you have now in adulthood when you're socially anxious. Yeah, exactly. Okay, what I'd like you to do now is tell me the way things are different now versus then. How are you different? How are other people different? Based on what you learned and all the experiments we've done in session and the experiments you've done outside a session as homework. How are things different now versus then? Well, there's a lot of ways I'm very different from when I was eight. <laughs> but a um, lot of experiences that I have, the wisdom I've gained, just overall, but the work that we've done in here has, has made me so much more confident in terms of not only just my skills and the ability to reach out to people, but also that being rejected is not so horrible, and that if that happens to me, I can handle it. So these are some important ways that you're different now. How are other people different now than in third grade? Right, so um, I rarely have to interact with third graders anymore. <laughs> I choose not to. <laughs> uh, most of my friends are adults, and um, most adults I know have very good manners, or at least way better than third, third, third grade girl manners. Um, so definitely the people that I would reach out to and try to develop a relationship or a friendship with are very different. Okay, so there are a number of ways that things are quite different for you now 
and different for other adults that you interact with now compared to when this image was formed, but you still sometimes have that same third grade image pop into mind as though things aren't any different. Right. So one way that will help you break the ties from the past is if as homework this week, how does it sound to you if every day, whenever you notice that you're feeling socially anxious, pay attention to how things are different now than they used to be. And after the interaction is over, at some point that day, write a few notes about the differences now versus then. Okay. And do that every day you experience anything that triggers social anxiety, including the homework experiments you already chose. Okay. And then bring that list to me next week and we could discuss how that's going for you. How does that idea sound for you? I, I, I definitely will try that. It, it sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you. Toward the very end of therapy, usually in the second from last or sometimes last session, I have clients fill out a continuing forward worksheet. We often do it together in session, or they might work on it as homework and we follow through on it. Oh, I don't have it here, but it's in the handouts in which they're identifying ways they've made progress, things they've learned about themselves, areas that are still difficult for them, and most importantly, they're listing the strategies and skills and techniques that they want to use both proactively and or reactively to help them continue the progress that they've made and to make further progress on their own. One of the favorite things I have about this work is getting emails, sometimes phone calls, usually not phone calls, emails from clients, former clients, telling me how they're doing now compared to before and the, not only that they've maintained progress but they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or that they've advanced in their career or that they have more fr uh, friends than they did before. And this worksheet helps them identify some of the strategies they want to use on an ongoing basis. Those are the proactive strategies, as well as reactive strategies. When they experience a lapse, a period with strong social anxiety, or maybe a time when they resort to avoidance or other safety-seeking behaviors, these are the strategies that they want to use then. And we work on that together with clients based on what they found most helpful in our work together. The last thing I want to indicate is there's a number of scales that you can use to help assess for social anxiety that I use in the beginning of therapy, somewhere in the middle, and at the end, but also much briefer scales that I use at every session to help assess the progress that they're making and the progress that they perceive themselves as making, which isn't always the same. These scales are either linked here or are included in the handouts. When I gave a shorter version of this workshop a year ago in the ADA conference in DC, I was quite anxious about people responding negatively to this integrationist strategy, that it's not a purist strategy. And some of you may feel that way. But I think all the different ways and all the strategies within the ways have benefit, and we may as well take the best from all of them and use them for the clients that need them. So typical social anxiety groups are 12 weeks, uh, but they don't do any core belief work. I do 20-week groups. Uh, I because I do a lot of core belief work in the latter half. Um, I forgot the second part of your question. Usually what's, what, how long does it usually Oh, that depends a lot on, I mean, it, it, usually it's a handful of months, something like three to six months, but if they're also quite depressed, or if there's some situational crises, or they're relying heavily on certain medications, it probably will take longer. And if they have avoidant personality disorder, it could take much longer. I do a little relaxation training, but the problem with some clients who have pretty severe physical symptoms, 
But the problem is there's a tendency of clients to then use it as safety seeking behaviors. Socially anxious clients may have panic attacks or at least something approaching that, but unlike with panic disorder, they're not afraid they're going to have a heart attack when they have a panic attack. They're not afraid that they're going to go crazy when they have a panic attack, which is, in my view, what interoceptive exposure, at least for panic, is aimed at helping clients learn otherwise. Usually they're afraid they're going to embarrass themselves. And so I don't put a lot of emphasis on that. If I know a client is drinking an awful lot of coffee, I might suggest otherwise. Or if they're on medications that might have anxiety as a side effect, we discuss that. But you're right, the physiology piece is a small piece. Well, typically, it's early painful experiences. So that we get into that really late, like Holly and I just demonstrated in the then versus now exercise. There's also imagery exercises where we can do the same sort of thing. Um, but typically, I don't get into that until late because I don't want to foster the idea that in order to overcome our social anxiety, we need to fully understand and somehow change what occurred in the past. So we work on a lot of experiments to help them build self-confidence, also to work on making friends or being more assertive, whatever their goals happen to be, applying for jobs. Um, and then we get to the core belief work and some of the past experiences that created the old core beliefs late. Very early on, since attention training, external mindfulness is usually one of the first interventions I I guide a client in. Um, very early on, it, uh, clients with ADHD um, find that much harder, but so we practice it for a longer period, and I stress you don't have to stay focused the whole time. The idea is to recognize when you aren't focused and to gently return your attention back to the conversation, the person, the activity in the moment, but yes, that's a complicating factor that can make it more difficult. Um, I'm out of town, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm out of town too, but I'm out of time, uh, but I will stick around, but I don't know if they need this room, but I will stick around because our time is up, but I want to thank everybody for coming. Please turn in your evaluation forms. <laughs>